Welcome to Sound and Vision, conversations with contemporary artists and musicians about the creative process. Here's the host of Sound and Vision, Brian Alfred. Sound and Vision is supported by the New York Studio School. The New York Studio School welcomes artists to join an upcoming five-day virtual painting marathon with their dean and founder of the legendary Studio School Marathons, artist Graham Nixon taking place this November from Thursday, November 10th through Monday, November 14th. The Studio School's legendary marathons present a wide range of art-making strategies, comprehensive critiques, and inspirational discussions. The virtual format enables you to join in real time from your own studio anywhere in the world. Expansive and experimental, marathons equip artists to relate to drawing, painting, and sculpture as methodologies for understanding one's experience in the world, the profound impact of which continues far beyond each marathon's conclusion. Visit nyss.org to apply today. Sound Vision is also sponsored by Golden Artist Colors. Golden makes the world's best acrylic paints and mediums, core watercolors, and Williamsburg oil paints. You can get their supplies in art stores everywhere or at goldenpaints.com. You know what keeps me going? Making work in the studio, podcasting with artists, teaching, being a dad, and everything else going on? Coffee. Specifically, the amazing coffee from Fulcrum Coffee Roasters. Fulcrum makes incredible coffee based out of Seattle, and the cool thing is, you can have it delivered straight to your door. Use the code ALFREDSTUDIO at checkout and get 20% off your order. They even have subscription services where they deliver different origin beans each week, Every two weeks, every month, however often you want your coffee to arrive. I have it, and it's amazing. I love the new blends each time I get a delivery, and they're always really good. Check them out at fulcrumcoffee.com. A couple ways you can support Sound of Vision, this podcast. Pick up the Sound of Vision podcast book. It's called Why I Make Art. And a couple things that really help the podcast, if you could do it. Leave a rating and review on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast. If you got the book on Amazon, if you could leave a rating and review there or wherever you picked up your book, that kind of support really helps it and it gets it out there to more and more people who might be interested in these artists and their stories. So thanks so much for supporting the podcast. Vicky Vanyunpa was born in 1992 in Toronto, Ontario, and she earned her BA from the University of Waterloo in 2015. Starting with a generative computer script and ending as oil on canvas, her work considers the impact of technology on the process of painting. Vicky's had recent solo exhibitions at the Hole Gallery in New York City and Galleria Nicola Padana in Italy. She's won many creative awards, such as the Liz Edwards Memorial Award and the Lewis Molstock Endowment at the Banff Center for Arts and Creativity. She was recently a resident at Palazzo Monti in Brescia, Italy, and Vermont Studio Center. Her recent group exhibitions include projects at Future Gallery in Berlin, The Hole in New York City, La Fondation du Mac in Montreal, and Olga Korper Gallery in Toronto. Vicky will be presenting new works coming up this November at NADA in Miami in a solo presentation with The Hole. Vicky and I talk about growing up in Canada, Pong, country music, the technological sublime, her paintings, and much more. Here's our conversation. I'm usually here late at night anyway, so... It's all good. Is this studio or home or home studio? Yeah, no, it's my studio. So I'll just give you like a little, that's my big windows. I nice. love having those. And then we've got about Plant life eight. too, which is nice. Yeah. Oh, that's a nice just, scale. Yeah. We're at 800 ish square feet here. That'll do and it. And I just yeah. uh, moved into this place in July. So prior to this, I had only 350 square feet. So Live and large in this one. Yeah, yeah. nice. <laughs> oh, more yeah. than doubled. 
Yeah, and it was That's necessary cool. because I was making such big work. So now I have actual space to stand back and understand what's happening. So isn't that important? Like st- being able to step back from a big piece. It's like it's crucial. so important. <laughs> yeah. 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 And the lighting too, you know, helps to have the natural light in here. And yeah, the building itself is really amazing. It used to be an old um, fabric factory, something like that. Oh, really? So it's it's been around for a while. Oh yeah. In the 1800s. And then in, yeah. And then in the late nineties, I believe it switched over to be a video game manufacturer. Or it must've been in the eighties. Yeah, they, it's actually Pong was manufactured here. What? Yeah. <laughs> That's a historical <laughs> landmark. <laughs> Seriously, you're, yeah. And you're in the birthplace of creativity. <laughs> I know. I feel so lucky. That's my age. <laughs> <laughs> but it was riveting. You know what I mean? When we got Atari, it was like amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm too young for Atari. I was the N64 uh, and, and the Game well, Boy Color. Yeah, that's good stuff, though. Mario games are my favorite, I think. That's just my sweet... I'm not a gamer, but yeah. I can do Super Mario Brothers. I like Zelda. That's my... Oh, Zelda was good, too. Good music, too. Whoa, nice. You yeah. really like Zelda. <laughs> I the really do. The music's good, too. Yeah, I know. I love them. Actually, oh my gosh, it's funny you say that, because I don't know if you actually saw my show in New York, or if that's how you discovered my work. Um, no, I but- discovered it just uh i'm trying to think of where i ran into your work i I don't even remember but no i did not see your show at the hole i apologize oh that's okay um but yeah i was mentioning that because for the video piece i did in the back room um -hmm. i did this big projection on three walls and it has a soundtrack to it that my friend nick showfield made and i was kind of describing him how to him how i wanted it to sound and I was like, it's like, you know, when you're in Zelda, you're going through the dungeons, you have this anticipation of the final boss, but you're not quite there yet. Like, let's do something like that, you know? And he really nailed it perfectly, too. It was really, like, smooth, melodic, like, a little sinister. Yeah, it was good. I feel bad because uh, I only saw the images of that, so I'm sure it's totally different with sound. Yeah, yeah, it is. You have to, you can watch it on Vimeo, I think. I think I put it up there if you're interested. Nice. I'll check it out. Yeah, I love that sound. If it's anything close to Zelda, that's good stuff. Oh, yeah. He's masterful, like soft synth music, like, yeah, really nocturnal and moody. <laughs> that's cool. Um, but you're in Montreal, right? Yep, I'm in Montreal. I've been here for about eight years. Eight, but where were you before that? Where did you grow up? Um, kind of near Toronto in a town called Waterloo. Well, it's a city. It's, it's a bigger city now. It's grown a lot. Um, yeah, about two hours west of Toronto. That's cool. Well, how did you, how'd you end up in Montreal? Was it for school? No, I mean, I thought I wanted to do a master's. And so I kind of was thinking I would love to go to Concordia, which is here in Montreal. But I just was attracted to the city. I, I came here for a couple music festivals and, Right away, the city had my heart, and I knew. You know when you just feel like somewhere is your place, you know? Sure, yeah. Yeah, I had that feeling, and it's very European here. um, There's all these little quaint spiral staircases. There's also murals everywhere, but then if you go to closer to Old Port, it's cobblestone streets, you know, feels very, um, yeah, very European. I really like it. That's cool. I've never, I feel... I really would love to go to Montreal, but I've never been. I've only been to Toronto, so I need to expand my uh, Canadian geography. You should, yes. <laughs> There's a big rivalry between Montreal and Toronto, actually. And oh, I really? find, I mean, I'm biased because I grew up near Toronto, but I find Toronto to be kind of, I don't know, less welcoming, kind of more cold, not quite as, um, I don't know, not quite as exciting as Montreal. You got to get here. Yeah. Well, that's that's saying something because when I went to Toronto, I really loved it. I was like, the food was really great. And oh, good. There's culture, and I, I I dug it. So. Oh, that's good. So you went to the right places. You found probably Kensington, and you didn't just stay in the downtown kind of skyscraper vibe. No, we moved. Yeah, we went around. We, I mean, a lot of times when we go places, it's food driven. My family's into <laughs> food stuff, so we kind of, you know, that kind of anchors some of our movement, but. Uh, but yeah, we, I really liked it. It had a good vibe to it. Yeah, so you grew up outside good. of there. 
Yeah, yeah. So Waterloo, it's about two hour drive. It's a suburban city, a university town. There are two big universities there, uh, Laurier and Waterloo. And so I ended up just going to Waterloo because it was in my hometown. But funnily enough, I have my mom went to Laurier and my dad went to Waterloo. And so they were each kind of like, of course, rival schools, like kind of wondering where are you going to go? Like, which one are you going to pick? Right. But <laughs> yeah, picked Waterloo. Well, what did, what did they do? Or what do they do? What, what was their field of study? Um, yeah, my dad is an engineer and he owns his own telecommunications company. And my mom studied business. She did her master's in business at Laurier. Nice. So, yeah, a little bit of What's both the, worlds. Do you do you trace a line of creativity through them in, in any way, shape, or form? I mean, engineers are usually pretty creative. Yeah, um, definitely. I mean, they were always very encouraging, just in general. Like, gave my sister and I, like, a giant art studio in the basement, so we kind of had free reign down there to just you know, paint, do crafts and sculptures and everything. Um, But I mean, my mom, she was, she did some watercolor paintings just as a hobby. And then my dad, yeah, I guess you could say like engineering is definitely creative. And he also, he always had like the newest MacBook and computers for us to play with. So we were allowed to like sit on his office floor and yeah, play, play games on the MacBook, like Snake, Tetris, and then yeah, a bunch of CD-ROM games. You know, the CD-ROMs used to come in cereal boxes. We used to do those a lot. Oh, really? They came <laughs> yeah. in cereal? Yeah, they oh, came for cool. free in cereal. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. CD-ROMs. Wow. That's a throwback. <laughs> Isn't it crazy? Right? How, yeah. It's it's oh, bizarre how quickly and how how like far away that seems at this point because of the speed of progression, you know? It was really a yeah. slow build at first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it crazy how fast uh, technology becomes obsolete. Yeah, for sure. Well, is your, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, isn't your last name Finnish? Yeah, yeah. So my dad's family I, is Finnish, but. But he was born in Canada? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Got it. And I have no, can you, t- how do you pronounce your last name? Is there a, is it tricky? It's not that hard. Uh, Vanyompa. Okay, I got it. Vanyompa? Yeah, that was good. Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> I don't know yeah, any with, sort of like Nordic names when you start adding little dots and stuff, I get a little intimidated. I just don't, I don't, I, I, yeah, I don't know if there's some special rules there. <laughs> Although I'm fascinated I, by language. So, but Nordic, like languages like that, I have no touchstone at all. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty terrible. I only know a couple words like uh, Santa Claus is Yolopuki milk my toi but yeah we really didn't have too much finish uh hopping around the house but the umlauts i like to say are very rock and roll i like having them in my name makes me feel like yeah, a rock that's, star yeah <laughs> it's pretty cool it's 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 exotic as far as like the alphabet's concerned <laughs> right <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool um do you speak any french being in montreal yes yeah you have to here right don't they teach yeah. they teach well i guess you didn't go to school there though but yeah. No, I, but actually everywhere in Canada you do take French lessons. So the whole um yeah, you ha- you have to take at least a little bit of French and then I did French immersion. So that means I took half of my classes in French. And so I kind of had a a leg up by the time I went to university and decided to minor in French and then decided I wanted to come to Montreal. It was it was much easier than just having the the non-immersion. Right. Well, what's your let's say day to day in Montreal, what's your 50-50, what's your percentage yield for English versus French? Well, when I was actually working a job, a J-O-B, um, I was doing 50-50 because, <laughs> yeah. you know, like dealing with clients or whatever, whatever the job was, you know, you have to speak both. But now that I'm just, it's just me in the studio, I would say, and I, li- I live in a very like English neighborhood, I would say it's mostly like 80% English, 20% French. But you're able to keep using it. You keep it. You keep it warm with it, right? It's not like fading away. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, because you do come across people who are pretty like they don't really speak that much English, so you have to. Right. Yeah. That's so cool. I took French for seven years in high school, and then in the beginning of college, and I never had a chance to really use it, so it just kind of left. And now when I hear it, or if I go to Paris and stuff, I can kind of, you know what I mean. I can catch a lot of stuff and. 
I feel like I could get it back if I tried, but it's funny if you don't use it, it kind of slowly leaves the room. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you really have to be immersed. But the the French here in Quebec, it's very different from Parisian French. So, oh, really? yeah, you'll you'll find out really quickly if you come to visit. It's very, um, I, I guess, like nasally. And then there's like slang that people use that is just complete. Like they don't teach you that in school. Like, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know. There's there's filler words that you wouldn't recognize. Have you gone to France to visit? I've been to France, but only when I was younger. So, I was gonna say, would they, do, do they shame? Because you know, when I try to speak French in France, it's a lot of times it's not welcoming. They just go straight to English. Like, listen, buddy. Yeah. I think <laughs> yeah. my intonation is pretty good. Like, I have an ear. I think I can, you know, mimic the sounds pretty well. But they're not having it. But is there a little bit of like, <laughs> you know, Canadian French shaming going on there? <laughs> there's a lot. There's big language wars here. I don't know yeah. if we want to get into it, but yeah, there's no, no, the, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Being an being an anglophone in Quebec is not very welcoming. I'll just say that. Got it. So wow, it helps to speak stuff. French, but yeah, they can tell immediately, like by your accent, you know. So yeah, that's it. Oh well, well, you speaking the language of art, right? So growing yeah. up, were you a drawer? Were you interested? I mean, I, it sounds like your parents created a little basement studio kind of like enabled but where where did creativity and how did it enter your life as far as you know like in school or maybe getting a little more deep with it yeah I mean so I was always down in the basement doing my own little projects like I would always choose to be making something with my hands rather than going and climbing a tree with my friends <laughs> or playing sports so um, I remember making like for some reason as a kid I was really obsessed with making large scale sculpture like giant life-size robots out of styrofoam and giant pencils that actually had like a the tip of a real pencil so that I could write with it but like we're talking six foot tall pencils <laughs> like <laughs> I don't fun. know I had ambition yeah <laughs> um so yeah I always had that kind of inclination towards painting drawing sculpture and then um in school I guess I was always doing drawing yeah I was definitely drawing I was never like the best in the class you know there was always someone who was like the artist like the art kid that was like join the club technically I was, uh, yeah right there with you I was like maybe fourth or fifth in the pecking order of like skills and that's being generous and that, I think it's a really good thing though right like it, it gives oh, you definitely. some sort of drive yeah like if you're the top person in your class you don't have to work that hard you already like deemed the art star you probably you miss out on a lot of good fuel and good like yeah totally. good drive that's what that's what those of us who aren't amazing tell ourselves it's like the uh, <laughs> it's like the thing of like it's not good to be really attractive because then you never have to really do anything like you just everyone's nice to you all the time <laughs> Yeah, that would be that would suck to be hot. I would hate to be. I hot. know it's it's be so irritating. It's it's a lot of work to carry. You know, it's just everyone's <laughs> likes you and is drawn to you for face Ugh. value. You know, Pretty I want to privilege. charm people from the inside instead of just you know. No, but all, all kidding aside, and I've said this before, like as you know, I'm a soccer coach in in soccer. I like the players who work really hard who aren't the most gifted. Because mm -hmm. the really gifted players, they're just given that. You know what I mean? I want the person who's not got all the tools but works really hard to, to make it happen. To me, that's like, you know, I think that's that's in my wheelhouse. But again, that's just because I'm not, you know, a savant at anything. <laughs> 100%. No, but, and it also, like, if you're technically skilled and you can really do something with great level of craftsmanship you lose the side of creativity you know like you can have that skill but I feel like the ones that were super good at that in school like they didn't have that urge to you know explore ideas or, or conceptual things it was just purely for the okay I can copy this image perfectly right. kind of thing yeah. definitely I totally agree I mean the Ramones probably weren't the best but man they really made a lot out of, you know what I mean? What what ability they had. There's something to be said for that, you know? You gotta be mm -hmm. scrappy. I don't yes, know. scrappy, yeah. But, um, so you weren't the number one artist in class, but you were into it. Yeah, yeah. I was like an arts kid for sure, but I wasn't the artist of the of the class. But yeah, like in and even all throughout high school, I mean, I was 
on uh, arts council. I was on the yearbook committee, you know, so I was definitely certified arts kid. <laughs> yeah, but you had, it sounds like you had a little leadership too, or some initiative on the other side of it, which is yeah, cool. sure. Yeah. yeah. I like to be part of things and make my voice count, but, and then I guess, um, I, I just always knew I would go to school for art. I mean, that was a given. And like I said, I just decided to stay in my hometown, which I think it was a good thing. I don't know. I guess it was a neutral decision. I got to, you know, stay with my boyfriend at the time. And um, yeah, just my dad kept doing my laundry. Oh my gosh, that's so embarrassing to admit. Why did I just say that to you? <laughs> we'll <edit> that out. <laughs> Whoa. But, you know, you have all the comforts of home. So hey, I yeah. I mean, come on. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you know, there's the, you, you were able to... I'm sure and it gives you a little freedom in a sense, you know what I mean? To have kind of like a little bit of stability there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And when you have the kind of basic things around you taken care of, you can really focus on school and put everything into it. And I yeah. mean, I was still working as well, which was tough because I had to pay my way through school, but um, yeah, it was nice to be in my hometown. So, and the, the arts program at Waterloo is very small. It was super intimate. I really liked it there, but I was a little frustrated because it was a liberal arts degree. Um, and so for years one to three, I kind of had to do, you know, a bunch of classes that I wasn't so interested in, you know, Psych 101, um, Social 101, just a bunch of different courses, English, whatever. And um, I really, at that point, I just wanted to dedicate everything to painting and art making. So I remember right. being so frustrated. Yeah, just that Looking they wouldn't back, let though, you. Are you glad? Um, I'm not so sure. I think that an actual art school would have been better because I was ready to quit by the end of the second year. I remember I was ready to just drop out of school and like literally do like interior design or something. <laughs> like oh, go wow. study you something. You really didn't like those gen eds. <laughs> no, I really did. I, I'm a very stubborn person and I don't like when people make me do things that I don't want to do. <laughs> Listen, you can so, say whatever you want on this podcast. It's totally <laughs> here. You're in the driver's seat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, so but, you, but you stayed in it you didn't bail I stayed in it and thank goodness because it did get better in third year they started allowing you you know it was it was no longer the drawing 101 and the make a color wheel it was right. okay make a body of work which was what I was really there for um, so I'm glad I stuck with it and I did have some really really amazing professors um, but I actually made a lot of big leaps in the summertime because like I said, I was super frustrated. So I was making, you know, my own series of work during the summer and taking it upon myself to go exhibit in, you know, cafes and just like local opportunities that were around. So as much as I'm grateful for, you know, my university experience, I do feel like I kind of made my way outside of that. Yeah. I'm right there with you. I mean, I went, I never went to art school. I only went to university. So I had all those general education requirements that at the time I'm like, oh, come on. I don't want to take speech communications or, <laughs> you know, you know, statistics. I remember that class was brutal. But, you know, looking back, I, I think I, there's something good about not going to an art school in a way because you just get more stuff like it's and you to your point, like you have a desire like you're like what what you don't have, you really are driven to get. So if like, if you can't do art 24 seven or it's not just an environment that's laid out there for you, then you really got to work for that time. You really value the time that you spend on being creative and making art. So it becomes almost like, you know, the, it's like you want the thing you can't have all the time, you know, and who knows if you have it all the time, maybe you just relax a little. It's not quite as intense. Although it sounds like you'd go 150% hard in the paint. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent. What about a uh, side note? What about music this whole time? Did you grow up with a lot of music or you a music fan? What was the parallel of music? Yeah. Um, it's funny. Okay. So during that time, I mean, my, my mom's side of the family is super musical and always we, we took piano lessons growing up. Um, they're all very good singers, you know, all my cousins and aunts. And kind of like a little claim to fame in our family is that my third cousin, so my grandma's cousin, is actually Julie Andrews. So we watched Whoa. a lot of, yeah, 
<laughs> we watched a lot of Sound of Music, and that was kind of just like, yeah, one of the most amazing like stories to just have her in the family and like hear my grandma talk about that. So, but I mean, I can sing okay. I do enjoy singing and playing the ukulele, but during that time, I was mostly playing piano and. Yeah, I guess when when I, what I was listening to at the time, um, a lot of country music. Really? Yeah, I I am a country music fan. Um, That's interesting. <laughs> there's something like just what so what kind of country are we talking? There's so so much different. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, like uh, Brooks and Dunn, um, Darius oh, whoa, Rucker. Like, <laughs> That's like. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to get startled. That's like real, like real straightforward I mean, country. Yeah, I mean, we had two country bars in town too. So that was also part of my nightlife. We were going out and like doing the country bar thing and riding the bull and it was fun. And the, I remember actually like when I was in university, Save a Horse Ride a Cowboy came out and that's like one of the biggest Brooks and Dunn songs. You know that one? Well, didn't they do Boot, Scoot and Boogie? Oh yeah, Boot, Scoot and Boogie. And that's the neon one I moon okay yeah oh my god <laughs> that's a, that's deep that's like real country it's funny because i the country that i like is like old hank williams you know like mm. the old mm-hmm. like kind of like i know i go i tend to go to roots to things you know no, and with country it's more that there is ruckers just hootie and the blowfish i mean i know he's yeah he's really good and he's a country guy now but i just can't help but think of hootie yeah it's, yeah it's just, there's not nothing wrong with that I mean, I like the country version of Hootie, but yeah, to each his own. Um, What was I going to say? I was going to say something about the, uh, oh yeah, I also really love like just stadium country music. Like I'm just a sucker for, I don't know, the sound of it. Now, here's a, I feel like I'm, I've met like, (laughs) I've I've met like a, uh, like this is like a very rare occurrence someone who's really in the mainstream country now do you (laughs) feel (laughs) how do you feel about country becoming so pop are you cool with that or are you more of like yeah you're you're down okay no i love because i also love pop so i'm just so vanilla i don't know what to say like i love hey it's pop (laughs) for a reason it's you know it appeals it's it's it is what it is but you're all in the chips are down for country yeah, all in. But there's a time and a place, you know, like I don't like sometimes I'll listen to country in the studio if it's like a nice sunny day. I'm feeling the, you know, the vibe. But mostly country is kind of for like driving, maybe for pre-gaming. For the studio, it's like, I mean, there's a sound for everything, you know. For the studio, if it's late at night, I'll go with some electronic, some house okay, music. Okay. All right. Everything just locked into place. Sorry. <laughs> The reason I was so gobsmacked by country is because when I look at your work and think about your process, I'm thinking of like, like Oval or Microstoria or, or like that kind of like glitch electronic stuff that's so into the processes of like how digital sounds are made and all that stuff. So, you know, which is ridiculous because I think, remember when Jackson Pollock, everyone, if I'm not mistaken, Everyone thought Jackson Pollock was really into like, um, you know, like free jazz, like Ornette Coleman and just mm-hmm. chaos because of, you know, the expressive nature. And supposedly he's just listened to like Billie Holiday all the time, which is really funny <laughs> that he, you know, he liked something that's way more composed and just. So anyways, it's, that's why I was like, oh, country. Hmm. I and mean, then human you beings are. On those with like boot scoot and boogie. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. <laughs> Human beings were multifaceted, you know. Aren't you can't we? box me I in. Agree. I like electronic yeah. and country, so <laughs> Hey yeah. I I listen to it too. Like I, I listen to pretty much everything. You know what I mean? So it, mm-hmm. but I do feel like to your point, and I think you were saying this, is sometimes when I'm locked in on like a painting and a vibe of the painting, I will put the music on and I feel like like notches into that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like if I'm listening to, you know, like Hank Williams or something and I'm making a certain painting, they just don't fit, even though I love that music. And so anyways, yeah, it's interesting how sometimes they, it, you know, it weaves in and out. And then I'll just be listening to, you know, like hip hop or something that doesn't really fit the image at all. 
sometimes you need a little hip hop. Like for me, I have a playlist called Respect and it's just like hip hop that's about, you know, like beefing yourself up and like telling yourself nice. you're the baddest, you know? Yeah. yeah sometimes yeah, you need yeah. a little bit of that. It's like a hype man playlist. Just like, <laughs> that's great. Mm hmm. Yep. Uh, is that a public playlist on Spotify? Can we get our hands on that? <laughs> I can share it with you for sure. Right, There's a lot of let's Megan do. The Stallion, Nicki Minaj. <laughs> sure. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> so you, well, in growing up, you were into country. You did a little piano. And mm -hmm. when you went to college, were you going to see live music at all? Or was it that part of your life? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, a lot of festivals, you know, electronic festivals. Um there was one especially that I really loved, which was called Electric Forest. And it was a mix of like indie music and then electronic. So, and it was all set in this beautiful forest that they lit up at night. Um, Whoa, that sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. And one of my. Of, uh, sorry, I was going to just ask if you were a fan of Caribou because I believe he. Caribou. Is from the neck of the woods. I don't know. Originally. But he's based in London now, but he's from, I think he was, is he from Manitoba? Not right where you are but you know canadian i'm trying to think of canadian electronica oh boards of canada they're not from canada <laughs> they're, they're Scottish, but they were amazing do you know boards of canada no i don't i should look i wrote down caribou um, oh. we have also a, a tribe called red which is a really good electronic group here nice i will check that out yeah but no, I was going to say, so at Electric Forest, like one of my favorite, favorite artists of all time that I got to see was um, Nako and Medicine for the People, which is kind of like an indie folk group. And um, yeah, he's one of my favorite artists. Nice. That's yeah. cool. So, um, well, let's get back to the art thing. What were you doing in in school? Like what kind of stuff were you making? I mean, you're, once you started developing your voice. Yeah, I was making um, really different work from what I'm making now. I was doing a lot of paintings of clouds. So I was I was still interested in kind of the same basic themes that I'm interested in now, like um, nature and man and science, technology and spirituality. And I was painting clouds because I was reading a lot about the technological sublime and the idea mm -hmm. of like um, the cloud having served in the past in painting as like a uh, setting for the manifestation of God. Like now the digital cloud is kind of like replacing these ideas of God in our mass media. And um, so I was just obs kind of obsessively painting clouds and thinking a lot about what the kind of digital setting that I was occupying was all about. Um, so there, it was like the seed of kind of the ideas that I'm doing now, but in a kind of, yeah, a different format. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that the um, the migration, at least the perception of the migration of the sublime from nature to technology and zeros and ones is a pretty compelling. I mean, was the stuff you're reading, or was it just kind of like mm -hmm. you're just thinking about it? Uh, yeah, it was stuff I was reading and listening to. I was like, I was listening to a lot of YouTube stuff. There was this one guy. I was into a lot of woo-woo stuff kind of back mm -hmm. then. So um, a lot of like manifestation stuff, a lot of like Eastern um, Eastern philosophy and thought. And there was this one guy called David Icke on YouTube and a lot of his videos were kind of influential. And then also Alan Watts, the philosopher, um, who is really well known for making these kind of quirky, funny videos like bringing uh, Eastern philosophy to Western audiences. So I was, I was listening to a lot of, of their stuff and yeah. That's cool. What is it about, what, what is the parallel between Eastern thought and the technological sublime or is there? Oh, I don't think there is. I'm just thinking back to that time. I mean, I guess where I read about the technological sublime was probably in a different essay. I can't, tell you who wrote that first but um just the ideas that were swirling around in my head were like about technology being um you know only destructive in the hands of people who don't 
like realize that we are one with the universe. And so I was really into this idea of like being one with the universe. And that's kind of what Alan Watts was preaching and what David Icke was preaching. It was this idea that we are all a technology. We're all this like abstraction of nature. And if you don't realize that we're one and the same as nature, then all of a sudden technology can be used for evil. And I don't know, these kinds of, these kinds of uh, crazy thoughts, like simulation yeah, no, theory I, I, and all of that. <laughs> I, I love that stuff. And I was really, when I was in graduate school, I was making abstractions, nothing like what I'm doing now that were based on fractal number systems because of exponential growth and this idea of, you know, an explosion of like, you know, back then it was kind of like, you know, there was this um, fear slash excitement of the impending, you know, um, explosion of data and information and technology to where it was just you know um it, it seemed like a tsunami that was just going to wash over us which it kind of did in a way but in a much more latent not quite so explosive and you know mm-hmm. it, it's it's ruling our lives now basically in a way or it's become a sort of you know a uh, appendage that we live with that really makes us um operate but yeah i was really compelled by those ideas and then also it the the music at the same time was you know incorporating a lot of technology which was really interesting i think and kind of like the new avant-garde in a way you know um but what was the technological developments that were happening at the time that you were really tapping into that idea like are we talking like the internet was really gaining steam right um no i mean so this was i was in school 2011 to 2015 so the internet was a thing. Um, we were past the MSN days. We were into the Facebook days, the Instagram days. Um, yeah, I think <laughs> I love this, it just... I love the epochs <laughs> of like, this post MySpace. Pre- <laughs> yeah, back <laughs> in the funny? old, the old MySpace days. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it was just really becoming apparent that this was here to stay and this was part of everybody's lives. And like, like you said, it it was really a, an appendage, like it was an extension of ourselves. And, um, the, it it was also really apparent that the internet was changing the way people were thinking and how we were seeing the world. Um, so yeah, it was, it's kind of, I guess the seismic shift of like 2000 onward. Right. Yeah, I mean it's a huge uh, the the thing that I really find interesting about your work and not even, you know, I've read some of the think the some of the text and stuff and and you know, and talking to you about your interests and stuff, but just on the work alone, the idea of using these technolo- technological processes to to drive the drawing for the image making in which you kind of have a sort of specific visual response to in relation to the aesthetic the aesthetics of digitally created stuff so it creates this dialogue between um you know usually using it as a vehicle to to create imagery and at the same time reflecting our biases or like how we feel our comfort level because like a different comfort level with any viewer with that kind of imagery right like someone might walk in a gallery and be like oh i just don't I mean, I dealt with that with the paintings I was making in grad school. Some teachers were just like, I don't get this. It looks like future stuff. (laughs) And they just didn't want to see that, you know. And then other people see it and they're immediately like, yes, this is the future, you know. And think it's like, you know, way forward. So, you know, I'm sure it lives in between those places. But um, was it something as you're making it, like that reaction and that dialogue with the viewer was something you were negotiating? Or were you just kind of doing your thing and hanging it up and saying, or, or just, you know, sharing it with people and saying, this is what I'm interested in. Mm, it's funny. Cause, um, I don't feel like I got that kind of pushback that you're describing that you got to, to your early, earlier works. Mm-hmm. Um, I think because I have this problem that I can't really make anything that's not beautiful <laughs> that right. people, <laughs> people are just automatically kind of drawn to the images, which, the seduction. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, mine yeah, weren't ugly. Yeah. Oh, I'm not saying, I mean, I haven't I'm seen just, them. I'm so joking. I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> but no, but I understand what you're saying about some people are really compelled by the, like, um, the, the CGI or the, like, aesthetic of the digital, but some people just really want to not engage well, also, it. So. Also, too, to be honest, I, 
when I was in grad school, it was the late 90s. So I think that mm. kind of imagery was maybe a little more threatening at that point because we had mm. it hadn't engulfed our lives yet. Because like the internet was barely kicking at that point and it, we just didn't have the usage of this stuff really. Like there were just computer labs. People didn't have computers generally. Um, so, right. you know, I think at that point, maybe there was more of a fear of, you know, I don't want this kind of imagery coming into the art world and like polluting it, you know, and then it's not real, you know, that sort of thing. And now I think it's yep. just accepted as a, you know, a viable tool that it is really. Totally. Yeah. You could still completely reject it probably back in those days. Like people could go hide out in a off the grid in a cabin and just not have a cell phone, not be connected to the internet, not, you know, not participate. But now, yeah, you're right. We really don't have a choice. It's part of our lives. So no, that and option was wonderful. Just saying side note. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It used um, to be nice and relaxing. <laughs> in the nineties, was that when kind of glitch aesthetic was happening? Yeah. When you were making well, that work? Glitch. Yeah. It kind of, yeah it came in the late 90s early 2000s so like when i was making those paintings that were really about kind of like that stuff and it looked kind of digitally and like i mean i was listening to a lot of musicians that were using new software to create music so it mm -hmm. sounded digital you know what i mean and they were performing with laptops which that used mm -hmm. to be like crazy <laughs> now yeah. it's just no big deal but back in the day if you go see a show and it's just a, a dude on a laptop you're like wait why did i pay money for that like people i mean not me but i mean some people would just be freaked out by it there's this which skrillex song is it it ends with this guy this old fart being like nobody hears a musician because nobody can play the guitar <laughs> <laughs> like, so many people think that <laughs> yeah but now you can't deny it. Like, of course, you're using a laptop to make music and it's no different, right? right? Yeah, so why wouldn't you? It's so convenient. Yeah. <laughs> it's so, e <laughs> I mean, you know, it was, it was so difficult to make recordings back then. Now it's, it's, you know, it's beautiful. I think anyone can make a record in their bedroom. Yeah. It's, but the reason I was asking about the glitch stuff is because uh, there is something kind of to me like a little bit ominous about the work that used glitch because it's kind of like pointing to the destruction um of tech you know and the deterioration and so it is kind of a scary um aesthetic the glitch aesthetic yeah well i i think but there are well I'll, maybe i'll make a playlist but there there is a lot of mu music that's made with glitched it's super beautiful like it's just mm -hmm. it's a uh, I think there was, they were trying to, some people were trying to subvert the idea of this nexus of information as being a degradation and something that was inherently, you know, disastrous for us as a, as a, you know, a race of people it was going to destroy us. And then they were consciously making things that were bringing, taking away authorship in like an overt way, but actually was really interested in beauty and chance and, you know, and kind of imbuing some sort of like sublimation of the beauty of, you know, you know, the Hudson River School style stuff, but in like the, the integrated circuits inside of a machine, you know, I don't know if people got it or not, if people cared, <laughs> but I think that was the <laughs> modus operandi. I think at that point it was, you know, no one had the ability before to do stuff like that. So um, it was kind of exciting as an artist at that point. I I felt it was really exciting because I felt like there was something being done, and and I don't think the visual side of it could catch up yet. It wasn't there, mm -hmm. like the the programs, everything wasn't quite there yet, you know. But music had it a little quicker, I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But I mean, so when you're in school, you know, and you're making that work, when does it move from the nature cloud? to the digital cloud in a way <laughs> not, that it, <laughs> yeah. not that it did it one-to-one -one like that but you know when did you start migrating into this new realm um yeah so i had my final exhibition um of my bachelor's degree and i remember somebody saying and so that was the cloud paintings and one of my professors had said to me wow these are really great like can you see yourself doing this for the rest of your life like, can you 
build a career off this. And that just scared me. I was like, um, <laughs> no, I better go do something else because I don't want to be stuck to this one thing that everyone's telling me is like super good and super interesting. So that kind of like spurred me into motion. And I took it upon myself to just do like my own little mini MFA of like a bunch of different residencies um, and really explore and experiment. So I took like about two years of like solid experiment experimentation time. Nice. And yeah, it was really, really good. Oh, and I went on a backpacking trip too in between um, the end of school and then moving to Montreal. So that was amazing too. Um, I went, I did a really important residency in Banff in 2017, which is where I Saw kind that. of, yeah. yeah, that's where I had the big serious breakthrough of like, um, I had been thinking about all these ideas. I had been teaching myself how to code. I had been diving deeper, you know, um, with 3D modeling. I was working as like a website designer as well, side note. So I was kind of like into um, coding and tech in that regard. And I was at Banff and I was thinking about, you know, how to make an abstract painting with the logic of the machine. And um, I was constantly kind of perusing you know, forums and like YouTube videos, teaching myself everything I could about 3D modeling and and everything. And I found this one plugin that was for um, character design and animation that actually, because back then in 2017, it was very difficult to model hair accurately on a model. So it was a plugin that just would generate random strands of hair so that you could have like a full head on your character. And I found this plugin, I took it and I had generated just one single strand. And that was kind of like the aha moment where I was like, whoa, this is a stroke, a scribble being generated by the computer. If I can use this as a starting point and kind of make my own software that will just randomly generate a bunch of these, then I could really harness this and like use this as a way for the computer to make the first move to make the first scribble and then I can kind of take it from there. So that's where the idea really started was just using this plugin that was made for something completely different, <laughs> you know, using right. it in a in the wrong way. It was a light yeah. bulb moment though. Was it um aesthetically, was it the, the kind of the way you wanted it to look at that point or was it just pretty raw? No. Yeah, it was pretty raw. So, I mean, you can you can generate all sorts of, like you can um adjust the diameter in that first plugin that I found, but you didn't have very much control over like how the curves interacted, um, you know, the depth, all of this stuff. So um, it was close, but it wasn't, it wasn't exactly what I had envisioned that it could be, you know, once I had the, the vision, but right. it was still interesting. And it was good because my, you know, the learning curve for 3D software is pretty steep and my kind of painting level as well was kind of like matched with my knowledge of 3D software. So I feel like as I grew more and learned more in 3D, I also became more technically skilled with the paintings. And so kind of like side by side, they just, the body of work just developed and yeah, matured. Yeah. What's the, uh, the technology uptick in the painting side of it outside of like, I mean, I'm guessing tape and airbrushes and you know, oh, no. and none, zero. Nope. I don't do tape and I don't airbrush. It's all That's just it. Uh, oil on canvas. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> I totally screwed that. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. let's just uh, take that out. <laughs> no, that's so, a great sorry. compliment. I'm so happy that it looks airbrushed. I mean, that's great. Well, I mean, there's <laughs> moments of gradient that looks kind of like an airbrush could be possible. Sure, definitely. Well, I'm working on actually like inserting a little bit more of like painterly moments and showing the brush a little more. Like in this one behind me, I'll just give you a close up. I mean, the people listening can't see, but um, like right here, there's a nice little strokey moment. Uh, so yeah. I'm trying to like leave a little more hints or like nuggets like for the viewer so that people understand this is a painting because it's important for right. me that they're paintings. Yeah, the, it's and is the... Um... Like how meticulous are you? I guess we're gonna get into like painting talk. Um, how meticulous are you <laughs> with the surfaces? Is it are you pretty? Like, do you have a method? Like, did you work towards like your own authorship of your materials in a way that feels really comfortable? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it was um, you kind of have to when you're working with raw canvas. Like, you have to yeah. prime it all yourself with the clear gesso, and I learned really 
quickly like how I want the tooth to be, like how much I want to sand. I don't want it to be super, super smooth. I don't want it to be as flat as the screen. That's not the goal. I want it to be a painting and and to reveal itself as a painting. So I do leave a little bit of tooth and a little bit of canvas texture on the surface. Um, but I do enjoy a nice smooth blend. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm. I feel like we have a lot of similarities here. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, in my work, yeah. I definitely. It's, it's frustrating because, like, when people see reproductions of it, they think it's just this slick, like flat. It's a, the word "flat" is always brought up, but they're not flat. There's a <sighs> lot of small, albeit, but there's a lot of textural stuff going on. But you really have to see it in person, you know. And yeah. it's obvious to me that you want to to show that both there you you get a sense it's these are created or there's some sort of influence of technology on the drawing or the aesthetic that's going on but at the same time with the raw canvas it's purposefully painting because that's just saying like here it is it's just floating on this yes. you know on this um organic material so it's a real sort of like digital slash organic process Yes. And the raw canvas as well. Like, yes, it signifies, hey, I'm a painting, but it also signifies this paint. This this is part of the network of painting. And right. as well, like letting the forms flow off the edge, because a lot of the time they flow off. Very rarely will I leave like the end of, of one of the forms in the um, the canvas. And so that also kind of signifies, yeah, there's there's more here. It, it continues. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that raw canvas is like the country. It's the country of the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And you got the electronica yeah. dancing around on top of it. Although, there, is, I, and then the aesthetic of it, of the beauty. I mean, I imagine that's something that you're trying to, you know. I mean, a lot of the stuff that I'm interested in is kind of like the subject matter can be pretty dark or there's like a looming quality to something just might not be right in this environment. But I try to lure in the viewer with something that's, you know, soothing or something that's easy on the eyes. You lure them in and then you sneak them with like a little yeah. jab, you know, <laughs> you hook them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And my favorite, like, uh, you know, some of my favorite stuff does that. You know what I mean? Like whether it's movies that are just beautiful, you know, like a Hitchcock movie that's just made amazingly, but it's just, you just that undercurrent of darkness to it or, you know, um, music like that, that sounds pretty, but mm -hmm. then maybe the lyrics are a little or something about it. Just this little, you know, grating or gets under your skin a bit. I kind of like that dynamic. Yes, me too. Um, I remember Nick Cave, I believe it was Nick Cave who said that he uses beauty as a hook to then, you know, talk about deeper issues and deeper uh, concepts. And I always, I definitely always keep that in mind too. God, that's way better put than I've ever done it. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's really well said. And, and I think it's, you know, I've always felt that way because although I do love punk rock, I feel like punk rock reveals itself pretty quickly. You know, I like the punk that's kind of like, you know, hidden or sneaky. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's not just overtly <laughs> like the middle finger of like, you guys suck. <laughs> you gotta yeah, I got to leave a bit of nuance. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> like Billie Holiday has that perfect mix, speaking of, of like this beautiful, you know, her voice is a little like it's just beauty and morose and it kind of, you know, it's got the yin and yang to it. I don't know any Billie Holiday I'm sorry, sorry. I'll strike that from the record. Uh, let's see. Uh, who would be a good person? Patsy Billie Klein. Eilish? Yeah, there you go. Billie Eilish. I don't know Billie Eilish that well, actually. Ah, uh, well, Who's, she's, oh, she's yeah. got the dark and the light going really well. Yeah, she. that's true. Did you, did you ever listen to that band called Portishead back in the day? No. All right, we're making a playlist. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're going to make one after this. Uh, but yeah, that's that kind of dynamic. And then let's, so, well, I guess getting back to school and stuff. So you started finding your voice after school, like once you got Oh yeah, involved. completely. Yeah. And when you immersed yourself in like these, you know, learning the tools of drawing and generating this stuff, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And really just self-directed. Like I said, I really wanted to just get out there and do a bunch of residencies, meet a bunch of people, have some real life experience. And 
um, once I had that breakthrough at Banff, it just felt like everything fell into place. You know, that was the start of this series that I'm still working on today, Soft Body Dynamics. And it just, I, I mean, I felt like I was in a groove. I still am in a groove. Um, what year was that residency? 2017. There you go. Pre-COVID. Yeah. Everything's pre. <laughs> pre yeah, and then you get, we get yeah. locked down. You're like, the world's my oyster. I'm like, open everything up and I've got all these options and then COVID hits. And it's like, oh boy. I don't know how don't, it did felt you for do you, okay but like, did you were you productive or did you shut down? Yeah, I was just gonna say like I for me I thought at first I thought this is gonna be great. I have so much time. I'm already an introvert. I'm already going to the studio by myself. I can just focus. I can make this like a self development self self developmental time. But then very quickly that kind of idea started to. Um, started to erode and the anxiety set in and the kind of the um, existential questions came up like, wow, the world is ending. Why am I making art again? You know, like, Oh, you went there. Yeah. It was, it was pretty scary. Yeah. I, I kind of lost sight of the vision and lost sight of the quest and just was really questioning everything. It felt like anything except for being, you know, like a nurse or like a frontline worker was just so silly. So, I definitely had that heightened sense of anxiety, but um, I mean, art wise in the long term, like looking back on it now, uh, it was fine. And it's, and in fact, things kept going. I kept making work and things actually were selling as well. Like for some reason, I, I don't know how it was for you, but I feel like yeah, that was a weird were buying thing. more. Yeah, that was yeah. weird. So that yeah, was super I think, weird. I think uh, we, you know, it, it is difficult, like you said, but at the end of the day, I just kept this attitude of like, well, this is how we process this stuff as artists, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe it's not the, not the most useful thing in the world or needed thing in the world, but for us as artists, it's necessary to process, you know what I mean? It's how we see the world. It's how we reflect on things. So when yeah. things go to shit for a little bit, you know, like, are we just supposed to stop processing at that point because it's not important to other people mm -hmm. necessarily? But, um, yeah, it's tricky, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and even if it doesn't show up right away in the work, you know, it's it's still there in your well of inspiration or in your, like, the, the memory is there in your body and it will show up in its own way or in its own time. So it's every experience is valuable. That's true. Definitely. I mean, I, I made a whole show of based on that anxiety <laughs> you know it was just like not that i i was celebrating that but it was just part of you know it is what it is you know yeah it's like every painting though I, I or not every painting but in general you know you struggle through some images uh divorced from what it is and what it means i mean just a process sometimes it goes great sometimes it's smooth sometimes it's a real struggle you know that's that's a mirror of life you know some days you yeah. wake up and you're just like, wait, I'm going back to sleep. <laughs> this one's, this <laughs> yeah, one's not working Yeah, it's not all out. smooth sailing. and That's cool. I didn't know you made a show completely about, you know, COVID anxiety. I'll have to take a look. That was yeah, in the early days of COVID or? No, well, yeah. I mean, it wasn't, it, it was, the work came out of it. So some of it was being developed mm -hmm. during it, you know. And it wasn't the intention to make like a COVID show or something, but it just ended up that um, a lot of the work was either imagery that was based off of photographs or, or based off of experiences during COVID. And then it was a an imagined escape from that, you know, and then a little bit of like breaking out of it. So it was uh, from all that stuff. But it was basically, you know, about life in the, that time, you know living through it yeah and it's so important for you probably to have processed that and to made the show and get it out there like did you feel a sense of relief after that yeah i think the yeah it's weird it's like, it's like that you probably feel this way the catharsis really is is making it or, yeah. or grappling with the images that are born out of that situation so i think in the studio is really where that kind of like you know visceral thing happens and then the show is always great and weird afterward you know it's kind of like 
I would imagine, you know, like when you write songs, it's kind of about writing the song. When you put the record out, it's great because you get to share it with people and it's really nice for other people to hear. But in your mind, sometimes you're move, moved on to like the next group of ideas or images that you're working on. So it's like, oh, cool. I'm glad you're, you know, it's it's nice. But in the moment, I think I'm very, um, I don't know how you are with this, but I'm very, I realized in the present all the time. Like I wow, don't, that's a oh, gift. To, to, well, um, ask family members. Sometimes it's not <laughs> a gift. Sometimes it's like, would you think of the future? <laughs> you want to plan <laughs> something? But uh, yes, no, I think mentally it's it's nice because you're living in the moment. And I tend to yeah. almost to a fault <laughs> just live in the moment, you know. Oh my gosh, I wish I was more like you. I am really anxious and always thinking about the future so i find it hard to like i have difficulty meditating i have difficulty getting into the flow state in the studio like Uh, um, most days i'm not in flow like it's a rare day that i get into flow so it's a real struggle but my mind is definitely wired to be uh, future focused now not to crack open that why do you think that is though like, why do you think you live outside the moment or like in the future? Growing up, was it a lot of like worrying about what's going to happen or? Yeah, this is going to turn into therapy, but I kind of like it. So my, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. No, it's really good. My parents divorced when I was 12. So I think if I'm unpacking some of that, you know, it was a traumatic experience and it was kind of like, you never know what the future is going to hold, you know, like all of a sudden oh, yeah. it's taken for like it's your childhood home is taken from you. Your family oh. unit has just like dissipated. And not only that, but my parents were quite like, they really didn't want to speak to each other. It was quite a bad divorce. And so it was like, we were just dropped off at the other's house every weekend. Like we had no say in it. And, you know, me, like a stubborn minded person, I hate being told what to do. I'm a Sagittarius. I value freedom. And you're a Sagittarius too. I am. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. So, you know, we're, yeah, we're stubborn minded, creative, free flowing individuals. So when someone puts us in a box and says, you need to go here now, it's like, it's hell. It's just hell. Not us. Yeah. Yeah. Not us, no, not the Sages. So, yeah, you know, I think if I'm if I'm really being honest and thinking about the source of that anxiety and that future focused mentality, I think it it does stem from that. Um, it's, yeah, it's a, I mean that makes sense. And can I make yeah. you feel a little better? Of course. I got mine. <laughs> I got my <laughs> present thing because my parents were like my they they were just like a day to day like they didn't plan for like retirements or like, you know, it wasn't, it was always, and when we go on trips, we would literally get in the car and just drive South. So it was just, oh, wow. you know, so there's something nice and free about that in a way, but then there's, it's good to plan sometimes, you know what I mean? It, like you mm-hmm. need a little bit of like preparedness or, and part of like, there's a fine line, I guess, between it becoming obsessive or, you know, a problem and not, but part of planning is like caring, you know, it's caring about the people around you and, and sort of like thinking about people. And I was, it was just like me, me, you know, that's why having a family was good. It kind of took me out of the me thing, but maybe it's a Sagittarius thing. Maybe it's an artist thing. Maybe it's a, I'm just selfish or whatever, but I've gotten way better at it, but I was definitely, I think living in the present can be great. And it can also also be a little like selfish and kind of, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like there's a lot of there's other stuff to consider out there. Yeah, for sure. You All can right. feel like you have blinders on and that you're not getting the full 360 view of everything if you're just always constantly in the moment. But I mean, yeah, <laughs> from my perspective, it sounds nice. But <laughs> well, the grass is always greener. But the grass as artists, is we greener. we are kind of like in our own heads. You know what I mean? It's kind of the job in a way. You know, totally. It's hard. So other people who aren't artists don't understand that. They're just like, well, you know, it it seems very egotistical, I guess, from the outside of just living in your own headspace constantly. Well, we have to we have to be confident and be the ones that care the most about our work. I mean, otherwise, you probably won't get your work out there and get it, you know, get the attention it deserves. Like, I feel like you have to 
you have to be the one who believes in yourself. Otherwise, right? Nobody else is going to. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the chefs are like that, right? They they're just you have to be in that kitchen working all the time and kind of obsess over it. And it may not make you the most responsible person outside of that situation, but to really get in there and just you know to find your voice and to you almost have to just marinate in it, you know. Yeah, at the, totally. At the cost of being socially responsible and, <laughs> and thoughtful and, you know, taking care of business and all that stuff. But I've, I've read it to ship. I'm on the straight and narrow now. <laughs> I found some sort of work life balance. You know. Good. Yeah. I, so, I'm um, struggling with that. <laughs> oh, you, but that's not a, that, but that's a good struggle, I'm sure. I mean, you're you're in it right now, right? You're just like all in. Yes, yes. But I have trouble saying no to things, you know? So I end up over committing and taking on way too much. So being busy is good, but not at the, <laughs> yeah. Totally. You're like, is that a Sag thing? Seriously. It must be. I, I, let's just say it's all a Sag thing. I, I think it might be. I mean, I just can't never say no. And I'm clearly like falling apart because I'm doing too many things, but I'll just be like, oh, that's a great opportunity. I'm not going to pass that up, you know? No. And like, you have to, you know, yeah, you really have to prioritize, you know, your health and your family and um, everything besides work. But I find a lot of artists are like this where, you know, we don't take weekends. Um, we're just 100% 24-7 in our work. And yeah. that's great and very romantic of an idea, but you're also a human being who deserves a life, right. you know? <laughs> that, yeah, rest once in a while. Well, and part of it too is like if you love what you do, then it's not like, you know, the saying, it's not really work if you love what you do. Um, but it is work and it's mm -hmm. exhausting. But, but when you do love what you do, you're willing to sort of empty the tank more, I think. Yeah, definitely. But is it healthy? I'm not sure. I mean, no, none of, none of that. These decisions, the only healthy thing I do is go to the gym. <laughs> it's a facade. Good. Oh, yeah. I saw this morning that you post uh, uh -oh. 180 pounds. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's, You're that benching 180. <laughs> no, that was, that was someone else. I just ran over and took a picture of someone else's weights. It's like a <laughs> a fake brag. But no, I feel like that's like you know it's healthy, quote unquote. Like that's something to do, which is you know it's good for you. But I feel like sometimes we can be very unhealthy on the other end of the spectrum of just like burning the candle at both ends, you know. Yeah, no, I Sex agree. Thing. I also go to the gym. Like, I really need it. Uh, it's where I can clear my mind and I go for Me runs too. too. So, so important, you know, so important. It's weird. I'm, I'm being serious. I'm not trying to be, I, I feel like there's a lot of similarities here. Like the things you're saying is like yeah. resonate, but then maybe it all is astrological. <laughs> Who knows, man? I don't know. Are you I into just, it? It's funny because no, I'm really not, but I'm, I know a lot about like me, like, I mean, you, you read the horoscopes and you recognize the things about you. That's why they're so successful. I guess, you know, you right. pick and choose. So I only know about my own sign. Um, but yeah, so funny that we're both Sagittarius. We should really look into this. We should make a Sagittarius Spotify playlist. It is done. I'm, do I'm working <laughs> on it. I'm going to send you the invite. Is your birthday, I, I feel bad. I should not ask your birthday, right? on air no you when's your birthday november 29th oh december 2nd oh very we're close the, we're the start and end dates of art basel this year are we <laughs> <laughs> we're bookending the art fair shit that is not i don't know if that's a brag worthy stat <laughs> let's take that one out <laughs> who shares no that's great who shares your birthday do you know anyone who's like got the same birthday as you and you're like oh wow Oh, you know, I looked that up once and I want to say Nicki Minaj, but I could be wrong. Ah, oh, your spirit animal. My spirit animal. <laughs> Nicki Minaj. <laughs> She's going on the playlist. Mine's Britney Spears. December 7th. No way. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. That is, isn't that great? That's super great. Oh, I'm wrong. Oh. Nicki Minaj is December 8th. But she's a oh. Sagittarius, so maybe that's yes. why I remembered. <laughs> You're Googling your birthday. <laughs> Sorry, uh, live you know, Googling. Just, no, that's great. Uh, no, no, we, that's, that's good to know these things. <laughs> um, so what's your day-to-day -day now? Like, let's talk, let's talk 
you, so you're you as you said yeah. you work hard you're kind of are you an everyday studio <laughs> kind of person yeah i am i'm every day in the studio but i don't start until late so i have my nice coffee in the morning and take my time and spend time with my cats by the way that's something i love about your podcast is there's always like a fun appearance of cats when i least expect it like loey hollowell's i remember oh yeah her cats. <laughs> and then who else yeah, oh her cat um, was really funny yeah someone else was saying that their cats like walk all over their paintings and i was like that's amazing yeah there's anyway. there's some cat talk i i have to close my my door here because my i record these at home and not my studio and my cats are out mm. there and if i leave the door open they they come right up but on the microphone you know just like yeah um, they want to be involved they hear your voice and they, they think do. you're talking directly yeah. to them they're like oh are you doing something where i shouldn't be bothering you okay i'll come bother you <laughs> and then when exactly. it's over they just leave and like nope i'm done Cats. it's not interesting anymore <laughs> they're such yeah. jerks <laughs> i love them they can just sense when your attention is on something other than them so yes. they just need to yeah. remind you that they exist every once in a while right um anyway yeah so i wake up late um usually i'm usually i go to the gym or i run before i come to the studio and then i'll be here maybe around like one or two and then paint until late nice that's a good yeah. schedule yeah i'm a night person and I mean, I don't have any kids or any other responsibilities other than my cats, so I can kind of, I can be flexible that way. I don't know how you do it with, you know, kids. <laughs> it must be you so get hard. You rhythm. Yeah. yeah. But you, you kind of, yeah, because I mean, I've, when I got out of school, I think it was like, what, it was a long time there, years and years and years where I didn't, you know, have a kid and it was kind of like all day and night. It was just like, oh, all the time in the world. And then when that happens, you get a little more you know, good at punching a clock. Like it's like, okay, mm -hmm. I got four hours here. It's go time. Same thing as like eating dinner yeah. when you have a toddler. It's like, all right, I got 25 minutes before this all goes to shit. I got to eat quick and enjoy it and then wrap it up. And it's like, same thing when you go to the studio, it's like four, okay, four hours, no Googling is just like work. And then you get out. So you kind of get good at managing your time. That's good. That's, that's a blessing. Yeah. Really efficient, I guess that way. Yeah, you. I mean, I definitely dilly dally less than I used to. <laughs> I used to have all the time in the world. So, but yeah, I um, your schedule does sound nice. I will say. <laughs> yeah, I I like being able to start my day later than most. So it's definitely, definitely lucky. Yeah, I'm a very. I've always well since graduate school. Because uh, I was the liaison for the visiting artist, so I'd have to wake up early. And then once I started doing that, I realized, oh, everyone works here until like two or three in the morning. And it's very distracting and crazy. But if you wake up at six and you come in, no one's here. So I, st mm. I kind of converted to a, a morning person. And ever since then, I've been up at like five. Wow. I love it. Yeah, that seems nice. I mean, that's definitely the goal, but... I would have to do a full like 180 on my current schedule in order to wake yeah, up so early. Yeah, you want to ease into that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> jump into that full. full I'm almost force. going to bed at five. Like, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Nocturnal, but yeah. that flow state at night is nice because it gets quiet. Like the, I feel like yeah. the phone stops a little bit. The emails slow down. You can like kind of do your thing. That's now, the it, key. Yeah. Is it music while you're working? I mean, well, you mentioned before, sometimes yeah. certain things fit, but are you also into like, you know, podcasts or like TV and movies and stuff? Yeah, yeah. I'm super into podcasts. Um, also, with the pandemic, I started doing a lot of social audio. So I was on like Clubhouse and Twitter spaces. Oh, and yeah. yeah, there's like, there's a few groups of people that I just like to hang out with in the studio and we'll just like chat with each other while we paint. That's really That's nice. Cool. Yeah. Talk about, you know, art news and stuff like that so that's always really fun but generally yeah i go between podcasts social audio and then music depends on the day nice um one more sort of like techie question is the software that you use always changing are you always upgrading or like tweaking the stuff you do to draw and generate on the computer or is it pretty locked in uh, it's pretty locked in right now. Like in the beginning, uh, there were a few like 
features, I guess, that I wanted to add, like to be able to control the amount of intersections that happen. So like if the if the spline was bumping up against itself, like that I could kind of pull it apart by just checking a box, um, stuff like that. And then like having fine tuned controls over each axis and where the the um, the spline points would fall on, on each axis. So um, now that I've got that locked in, no, it's really it's pretty it's pretty solid. But the nice. the pl- so it's it's a pl- the piece of software is a plugin for Cinema 4D, and obviously Cinema 4D has a bunch of updates always. Right. So if it has to update for the software, then that's a different thing. But is it um, does it still surprise you, or the things that are happening that are kind of like happy accidents or improvisational, mm. or is it, are you orchestrating that stuff down to the T? Um, no, no, it still surprises me. Like I have. Basically, you can input certain settings um, and then just let it run. So it depends on the numbers that I put in for, you know, like the seed number and the variations. And then I still get some pretty nice surprises here and there. Um, Mostly, like I've kind of seen many different types of curves at this point. um, And I know which ones that I'm really drawn to. But yeah, it's... um, it does still surprise me. Also with the textures that I use, because like, well, in 3D software, you call the materials textures. Um, so right. the reflective textures often will surprise me because you never know exactly how the light is going to bounce around. And um, so that's an interesting part that still leaves a bit of a bit of surprise. But I do, like, I see what you're saying. Like, you're kind of asking, like, when will it run its course? And I am kind of getting oh, no, to I maybe the... That. <laughs> I was no, just well, curious as to if it's constantly shifting or if it's something that like you're, you know, like deeply investigating one sort of method. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm definitely still really like <laughs> oh. researching that. <laughs> what? I wasn't like, well, how long are you going to beat this dead horse? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's my artist anxiety kicking in being like, no, not oh, at God, all. I, I hope- love it. It's great. I hope nobody thinks I'm in repetition mindset, you know, toxic thinking. But um, yeah, I was going to use that as like a way to just talk about kind of the new ways that I'm using the Bezier curves, which is, I don't know if you saw like my second most recent painting that was presented at Mm -hmm. the Armory, um, where I'm starting to use eye tracking software as the source for the Bezier points. So I'll look at just like a painting, um, a historical work of art. I'll record my gaze while I'm looking at it and then take the hot spots of where my eye fell the longest or lingered the longest and use those as the data to, you know, map the curve, which I found really interesting. Yeah. So that's kind of a new route that I'm exploring right now and I'm calling them gaze paintings. It's very cool. Yeah. It's so yeah, it's super interesting. I'm not I wasn't implying that. I mean, not for nothing, one of my favorite artists is Ankawara. So mm. you know, he he kind of he does something sort of monastic and, and really beautiful about a deep look at something. And your work is nothing yeah. like that kind of, you know, um repetitive there's no it's it seems like I love the word generative, you know, because it is it just feels like it's constantly, it just feels like it's growing and it's this, yeah. uh, I know it's, there's a digital touch point there, but it feels very organic too. Yes, definitely. Um, it births something new every time, you know, like there's, it's, the element of surprise might be gone because I've worked with it for so long, but it's still the, just the fact that it's something fresh that it's generating each time and that there's endless possibilities. Like, the randomization of it still interests me. It's very cool. Um, well, what do you ha- do? You have anything coming up where people can see your work? Yes, right now, um, all of these paintings in my studio are going to be going to my solo booth at Nada in Miami nice. this year. Yes, and I'm also doing a big sculpture for that, so I'm super excited. It's going to be oh, wow. interactive as well, so you can sit on it and interact with nice. it. A big nice soft sculpture yeah very cool so that's are you going down to miami for that for that yeah yeah cool that's exciting yeah, I'm super excited yeah <laughs> are you gonna be in miami no i'm not gonna be in miami not this year i don't think okay but i'm doing um i'm not going but i'm doing a thing for singapore for that art fair 
So. Oh, nice. Yeah. That should be cool. Oh, uh, which one is in Singapore again? Uh, I think it's called Art Singapore. It's new. It's a new one. Okay. If I'm okay. not mistaken. It's like, uh, yeah, it's a new art fair that's supposed to be pretty cool. I mean, Singapore seems, I haven't been, but it seems amazing. Yeah, for sure. That's exciting. But I love showing somewhere I haven't shown before. That's some, there's something really fun about that. Yeah. And um, it's a good excuse to go travel. <laughs> yeah. I, I would love, I mean, that is a long flight. I go to Japan a lot and that's long, but Singapore is like the longest. I think it's like 18 hours or something. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you lose a couple of days there. <laughs> yeah. <on> the plane. <laughs> um, and then online you, you do social media and website and all that stuff. Yes. Best place you want for me to say to that? What you're doing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's up to my you. <laughs> my Instagram handle is at Vicky J V V I C K I E J V, and my website is just my name dot com. Nice. Well, thanks so much for talking. It was really cool to to meet and check out your work. It was so good to meet you. Um, this was amazing, and thank, thank you. you so much for having me on. Sure, thank you. Sound and Vision is recorded, edited, and produced by myself, Brian Alfred. Many thanks to Fulcrum Coffee Roasters, Golden Paints, and the New York Studio School for sponsoring the podcast. Many thanks to Vicky for taking the time out to talk to me. Make sure you check out her paintings. They're really cool. She's going to be at Nada in Miami, the whole gallery, so make sure you check that out. Many thanks to all of you who've picked up Why I Make Art, the podcast book for Sound and Vision. If you haven't picked it up, it's $25. You can get it wherever you get books. Many thanks to Michael Lovett for the intro. And many thanks to you guys for listening. Got some really great artists lined up for future talks. Excited about that, so check that out. If you happen to be in Santa Barbara, California anytime soon, my work will be included in a museum group show called A Bold and Unconventional Collector Highlights from the Barry Burkus Family Collection at the West Mont Ridley Tree Museum of Art in Santa Barbara. It opens November 17th from 4 to 6 p.m. So if you're around, check out the opening and check out the show. Also be featured at Art Singapore coming up in January. More about that soon. Many thanks. Thanks.